What is going on guys, Ivan here. When we think of Nintendo, we think of their iconic franchises such as Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Donkey Kong, and so much more. But back in Nintendo's lifespan, Rockstar ported several installments of their best-selling video game franchise, Grand Theft Auto, on their systems. Now, before we get into this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on post notifications for more video game-related topics. Now that all that is out of the way, let's get started in with Grand Theft Auto games on Nintendo systems. Now, these games are definitely not third-person by any means, like GTA 5 or San Andreas, but are actually played from a top-down perspective. All of the GTA games were published on Nintendo's handheld systems, so no such thing as San Andreas on the GameCube here. Ironically, most of their games were released on the Game Boy line. Developed by Tarantula Studios and published by Rockstar, released in October and November of 1999 in North America and Europe, was the first ever GTA game to be ported to the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Much like the PlayStation and PC, the game has you select from a number of characters to complete missions with. However, the Game Boy port technically features more characters based off of the development team accessible via a cheat code by changing the name of the character, Kelly, to Sumner. Nonetheless, regardless of the change, it doesn't alter the physical appearance or gameplay in any way. Like the PlayStation and PC, the game is set in Vice City, Liberty City, and San Andreas, cities that will be later used in future installments of the series. Surprisingly, the Game Boy Color version wasn't changed so much which was quite a technical achievement due to the large size of the cities. Rockstar was able to convert the city tile for tile from the PC original, making them many times larger than most Game Boy Color game worlds were because of the handheld's limited hardware. The port is also playable on the original Game Boy system, sacrificing only the color palette for playability. To cater for the target younger audience, however, the game was heavily censored with gore and swearing removed. Wanted levels were represented by a trouble bar in the Game Boy Color. But the Game Boy Color port nonetheless still displays its technical limitations. For example, pedestrians rarely ever spawn on the streets unless the protagonist is driving a vehicle and the police have notoriously inferior AI that can result in cars spawning and being trapped behind a building before they can even come out to the player's position. These make most combat outside missions highly impractical and evading the police is turning into a cakewalk even at the highest wanted level. The worst limitation is that driving is super hard to do specifically because the car make takes an eternity to turn and the map is so zoomed in you can't even see where you're going. What makes this even worse is that cars are super fast so you can always end up bumping into pedestrians which makes your wanted level higher but that shouldn't really matter because it's too easy just to get away from the police or you end up hitting buildings which end up crashing your car. I also felt this game was a buggy hell at times. Sometimes I wouldn't be able to complete missions because I would go to the marked location only for the game not to register me being at the place where I was told to go. And when I was in a car that was supposed to be driving in for a mission, it would get stuck between other cars that wouldn't move, resulting in me having to restart the whole game just to redo the mission again. The game also features a radically different soundtrack from the PC and PS1 versions, replacing all the songs that play on the radio and menus in those versions with 8-bit instrumental tracks. Take a listen. In my opinion, I feel like this port is a buggy mess and almost unplayable. You're better off playing the PC or PlayStation versions of the games. However, for a Game Boy game, this is a really good considering that almost none of the games in the Game Boy library are this huge in terms of places to explore. Now that we looked into the Game Boy port of the first GTA game, let's look into the port of GTA 2 on the Game Boy Color. Just like the first port, this game is developed by Tarantula Studios and published by Rockstar. 
This game was released on November 10th, 2000 in Europe and Australia and released in December 25th, 2000 in North America and Canada. The year the game is set in is extremely ambiguous. There are police records on the Grand Theft Auto 2 website showing the dates of July 7th, 2013 and July 10th, 2013, indicating that the game may be set in July 2013. Similar to the first GTA port on the Game Boy, it had to be dumbed down to lower the age rating. So again, gore and swearing were removed. GTA 2's gameplay is presented via the top-down perspective as in all GTA 1 ports. The game also included a unique gang reputation system which still remains unused in any other Grand Theft Auto game to this day. GTA 2 takes place in a large metropolis only vaguely referred to as Anywhere City. The city is heavily stylized in a retro-futuristic design, displaying a contrast between a vivid color palette and advanced science fiction weapons and post-war architecture and transportation. All civilian vehicles are retro-modified versions of popular cars and trucks built up to the 1960s, further reinforcing its retro-futuristic influences. Just like the first port, the game allows you to choose between several different characters to go on to different missions. Note cheat code characters here though. You complete missions for money. The game is divided into three areas, downtown, the residential area, and the industrial area. This game differs from the console counterparts as you can choose between different characters other than the main character, Claude Speed. When you start the game, it's easy to tell that it's no longer a ghost town. There are now pedestrians and cars unlike the first GTA. The game is way more polished than the first one, and unlike the first GTA, this game is a Game Boy Color exclusive. And unlike the first GTA, the police are way more harder to get away from. In my opinion, it is a huge improvement towards the original. It's actually pretty playable now, but if you have an option to choose between a console or a PC port and the Game Boy port, you should definitely choose the console or PC over this port. Now that we got the most stressful games out of the way, let's look into the financial failure of a game, Grand Theft Auto Advance. The game was released on October 27, 2004 in North America and was released three days later in Europe. The game is set in 2000, one year before the events of GTA 3, and it is set in Liberty City, the GTA city that appeared most prominently in Grand Theft Auto III. Indeed, the earliest announcement of this game was that it would be a port of GTA 3 at some point in development. It is unclear exactly when this occurred, but this idea was rejected, probably due to technical limitations and a time needed to reconstruct the previous game's missions into the new two-dimensional environment. The game that was actually released is a prequel to GTA 3, taking place one year prior to the events in GTA 3. As it takes place in GTA 3's Liberty City, Familiar landmarks reappear and the overall street layout is the same. However, the locations of familiar secrets such as rampages and hidden packages and jump ramps have all been changed so for players familiar with the city's corners and alleyways in GTA 3 will have to explore them afresh in GTA Advance. The city's three islands have been noticeably changed and its conversion and elements impossible to interpret to a top view perspective so there are no longer any slope surfaces and the tunnels and train system have been removed. The game's protagonist is called Mike with some of the GTA 3 characters reappearing in the game including bomb shop owner 8ball and Yakuza co-leader Asuka Kazan. However, none of the Mafia characters from GTA 3 appear and entirely new characters such as Vinny, Mike's friend and first employer, Cisco, the leader of the Colombian cartel, Johnny, a bartender, and Yuka, Asuka's niece, have been added. Several characters which were only referenced in GTA 3 are now met face to face such as King Courtney, the Uptown Yardies boss. It is also the only game in the 3D universe that allows the player to change the plot by making choices though they will all lead to the same ending. The game had to be adapted to the Game Boy's hardware limitations. As a result, it does not have voice acting or animated cutscenes, nor does it have much louder pedestrian dialogue of GTA 3. All cutscenes are text only with line art pictures of the characters' faces, sometimes with a thematic backdrop behind. 
the art styles consistent with that he used for the cover and loading art of the three dimensional releases in the series. Replacing the pedestrian dialogue, some sound bites taken from GTA 3 are played when the player hits someone's car, but there is a limited variety, leading to much repetition. The game does not feature radio channels. Like the Game Boy Color ports of GTA 1 and GTA 2, each car has one fixed tune that is constantly repeated and cannot be changed. These include parts of some familiar GTA 2 and 3 tunes and instrumental versions. These limitations, coupled with the game being released on the same day as its highly anticipated cousin Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, is probably why the game failed so hard. In my opinion, the game isn't good, but it's more bad of good. The vehicle's physics that govern how the cars react in a collision just feel strange. The cars pinball off one another and go flying even after slight hits, and the vehicle's weight isn't taken into consideration as much as it probably should have been. On top of that, the game does a poor job at delivering any real sense of speed. One of the great things about old GTA games is that they really ran fast and smooth, making high speed driving a real thrill. Here, the game sort of sputters along and you never really get the feeling that you're driving through the streets of Liberty City at breakneck speeds. Of course, it's a hardware limitation, but it still could have been improved a little bit more. Furthermore, the game's camera zooms out when you start moving faster, but it doesn't pull back far enough to give you a clear view of the road, making dodging traffic and turning a real chore. When driving, you'll probably spend as much time looking at the map as you do looking at the road, though unfortunately, the on-screen map can't be large enough. The game comes with a fold-out map of the city, but this is completely useless since the piece of paper isn't going to show your current objectives on it. Overall, the game is alright if you're ready to deal with the limitations. Okay, now that we got all the bad games out of the way, let's look into one of my favorite DS games of all time. GTA Chinatown Wars is the last GTA game to come out on a Nintendo console. This game came out on March 17th, 2009 in North America and released three days later in Australia on the DS. This game has no European version. Alright, so I'm gonna probably butcher these names, so bear with me. Huang Li, the spoiled son of a recently murdered triad boss, arrives by plane in Liberty City, bringing Yu Jian with him a sword that Huang's father won in a poker game intending it to be used as a heirloom to deliver it to the new patriarch of the family Huang's uncle Wu Kenny Li. Shortly after landing Huang's escorts are killed by assassins and he is shot by a bullet that graces the side of his head but he survives. The assassins steal the sword and thinking that Huang is dead dump his body in the water. Huang manages to survive and informs Kenny that, Yu Jian has, that the Yu Jian has been taken. Kenny explains that he had intended to offer the sword to Hisin Hiao Ming, the aging triad boss in Liberty City, as a means to securing a position in his replacement. Kenny has been dishonored and reduced in power due to the loss of the Yu Jian, leaving him and Huang working to keep their businesses afloat. Development began to the mutual interest in the project by developer Rockstar Games and console creator Nintendo. Chinatown Wars is played from a top-down perspective with a rotatable aerial camera that allows the player to dynamically change angles during action sequences. Unlike previous top-down titles in the series, Chinatown Wars uses a fully 3D graphics with the exception of its cutscenes. As Huang Players are allowed to freely explore Liberty City and its Grand Theft Auto rendition. Upon release, Chinatown Wars was critically acclaimed by critics with praise directed towards its gameplay, mission design, visuals, and also general quality as a mature rated handheld game. Although it also saw controversy for its inclusion of a drug dealing minigame. The game's original release was noted as below developers Rockstar's expectations selling under 900,000 over its first two weeks on the American market. In my opinion, this game is highly underrated and 
way better than the other GTA games on Nintendo systems. There was so much to do and seeing the huge lively world on an old handheld system amazes me. So in my opinion, GTA Chinatown Wars is the best GTA game on the DS and just a, a really good GTA game in general. I certainly wouldn't put it on top of GTA 5 or San Andreas, but I'd probably put it on my like number 3 or 4. What is your favorite GTA game? I'd like to hear your opinions down in the comments below. Just because they haven't released a GTA game in a while doesn't mean it's impossible. Recently, Rockstar was able to publish their other franchise, L.A. Neuer, I think that's how you say it, onto the Switch. So it's not that they don't have the licenses to do so, it's just that they need hardware compatibilities. I don't know, maybe a GTA San Andreas port would be good. Make sure to like and subscribe if you're new here. And also remember to turn on post notifications for new videos. I hope you guys liked this new type of video I did. Because I was kind of starting to get bored of the custom firmware and all of this other hacking tutorials. Um, that doesn't mean I'll be uh, stopping those. I'll just be trying. I'm just trying something out. If you guys like those videos, I, I'll, be, I'll keep on doing those videos. So... Yeah, you don't really need to worry so much. I'm also going to be doing these videos and tutorials at the same time. So, yeah. So, make sure to le leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you all later. <laughs>